I didn't take the typical scientist route. Yes! Wow. Exploration is something that's really deeply embedded in your soul, and it's something that you almost carry as a gene. And I'm tangled up in its web. <laughs> there it comes, go! What a sad thing if rather than becoming a part of science books, nice and strong, they become a part of history books, and we'll never get to see these amazing animals. The coolest thing about this is that this is an absolute first. That's what really motivates me is if I do something to try and help protect these animals in these wild places, that they're going to be around for, for generations to come. Tonight, I'm going to basically be walking you through, through the journey uh, that is my life. Uh, which can get pretty crazy and wild at times, uh, and about to get wilder, as <laughs> Jeff mentioned, with the twins. <laughs> um, I didn't take the typical scientist uh, route. Uh, as, as you can see in this image, I've, I've actually spent more than 15 years now working in the field with animals, uh, with National Geographic, uh, 10 years uh, shooting wildlife documentaries all over the world, working with uh, leopards, uh, sharks, uh, giraffes, you name it. And, and it's been a, an, a really amazing journey. Uh, but, <laughs> <laughs> and my mom loves that I'm using this picture now. <laughs> my upbringing, I, I should have never been here really. Uh, my, my parents uh, were Cuban and very overprotective, and uh, as I refer to them, my, my three mothers pictured here, my grandmother, uh, my mom, and my aunt, very strong-willed, very feisty women. And I was their, their preci precious little doll, uh, who they expected uh, to grow up to be, you know, very girly, girly-ish. Um, as I was writing this book, I started inquiring more and more about my family history. I realized that the, the fruit doesn't really far, uh, fall that far from the tree. Uh, my mother here uh, is get, it's from a newspaper clipping, and that's why the quality is so bad on that image, but she was stepping on one of the first boats that was leaving Cuba, and she was leaving everything behind, uh, possessions, everything she knew, everything she loved, uh, the country she was born in, medical school, everything, and leaving with absolutely nothing uh, didn't even look back at the island, she says, just looked forward to where she was going because she had to leave. My grandmother uh, witnessed quite a lot of atrocities um, in Cuba when, and, and during the beginning years of uh, the Castro regime and was uh, working in a, sh in a volunteer sh uh, sugarcane concentration type camp. Uh, <laughs> and these are really strong women. My grandmother, who made the decision overnight to leave this country uh, that she had known her entire life and leave her place. They didn't speak the language, had nothing, knew no one, and they embarked on this journey themselves bravely. So I think I, I inherited that not knowing, because we never really took many trips as, when I was a kid, uh, but I inherited that explore gene from them. I've always loved animals. At the house, I basically had a zoo growing up, uh, dogs, cats, pet chicken named Maggie. That's a fake alligator, for those of you wondering. Um, and uh, you name it, I had it. And if I was walking home from school and it was within a certain mile radius, it, you know, it, it came home with me. So I spent a lot of time, although growing up in a big city, sort of just attracted, naturally pulled to nature. I guess a bit of a tree hugger in, in that sense. Now, it was in, in college. Um, I decided I, I wanted to become a lawyer. And I was a double major in English and philosophy. And I was well on my way when suddenly I realized I, I, I was short a science credit to graduate. And the women's biology course that I wanted to take was full. So I looked down the schedule and I found this class called anthropology. And I decided to take that to fulfill the credit. And it changed, completely changed the course of my life. Uh, when I started asking about different primates, uh, there weren't even photographs of these animals, and yet they were listed as, you know, two of the, 
the top five and 10 most endangered primates in the entire world. And I thought, what a sad thing if rather than be, becoming a part of science books, they become a part of history books and we'll never get to see these amazing animals. And I really felt this, this compelling need to go out there and, and do something. And I, I'm not sure I knew what to do at that time. In fact, I know I didn't, but I wanted to do something. Now there was a catch. I, I said I was raised, you know, very overprotective family. In fact, I wanted to join the Girl Scouts so bad when I was a little girl. And I wasn't allowed because my mom said it was far too dangerous. <laughs> so I had never been camping. I'd never done any of these things. Uh, and I wanted to go to one of the most remote and unexplored regions at that time in South America, in Guyana, where it really was impenetrable forest. I mean, just deep jungle that you read about, like the lost city of Z. And um, that's what I wanted to do, never having been camping. On top of that, I was a cheerleader for the NFL at the time. <laughs> now, why is that funny? <laughs> but not exactly what you'd imagine Charles Darwin doing in, <laughs> in his spare time, I realized. So there were all these odds stacked against me, all these expectations of what I should be when I grow up, and all these paths that I had already kind of chosen for myself based on those expectations. And now everything had changed, and I really wanted to go out there and study these animals. You know, when I saw Diane Fossey out there with, uh, with these amazing creatures, these majestic animals, I knew that that's what I wanted to do more than anything else in my life. And so I decided right then and there to change career paths, almost start school over again so that I, I could become a, an anthropologist, a primatologist, a scientist, and go out there and, and explore these wild places and study these wild animals. I wrote up my first grant, and I headed off to South America in this ridiculous looking outfit <laughs> uh, with nothing more, and I kid you not because it was a very small grant, uh, with nothing more then a backpack, a tent, which I learned later was the absolute wrong choice because there's so many venomous uh, poisonous snakes in, in South America, so you don't want to sleep on the floor, know that now. Uh, had to buy a hammock and, a, and just this little teddy bear backpack and a notebook. And that's all I left with um, to venture out. Of course, I had to pick up a machete once I was there. <laughs> but I fell in love with, uh, with the forest, I fell in love with uh, the local people and all of the things that I was learning from, from the villagers out there. Uh, I got to see animals that, again, nothing was known about them. They were very endangered, uh, found new behaviors that had never been documented before. And I just, that was it. It was, that was the bug that got into me. When I realized that exploration is something that's really deeply embedded in, in your soul and it's something that you almost carry as a gene and uh, there was no turning back from there. So from that trip, I decided I, I wanted to up the stakes a little bit, in a sense. Uh, I'd, I'd spent many months in, in South America, uh, but there were those lemurs that I showed you in that, that Time Magazine article that I really wanted to go and study. And so my next uh, expedition was to Madagascar, which is the island off the east southern coast of Africa. And for scientists, uh, this, there's really no richer place on Earth for biodiversity, the amount of uh, different species, and how threatened really the forest, the habitat where these species live, which makes it uh, a, a recognized hotspot, and one of the top, if not the top, hotspot. It's this beautiful, just majestic looking, just beautiful island. And I fell in love the minute Seriously, the minute I stepped off the plane, I felt like I was home. I'd never been there, but I really felt like I was home again. Uh, the people are amazingly friendly and warm and welcoming, me and welcoming. So on top of the beauty of the place, there was the people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then the animals. I mean, talk about this magical land of beautiful creatures. Uh, lemurs, were, they're found nowhere else on earth but this island. And at the time that I began studying there, there were about 30 species known to science. 
some of them looking very Dr. Seuss-ish like <laughs> in their characteristics, all very sort of weird with, with funny adaptations like these long fingers. And I mean, that doesn't even look like a primate that's related to us. Um, it's really amazing place, but now there's over 90 species of lemurs recognized. And that's how little we still know about our natural world, which is a motivator to keep going back to them. As far as expeditions go, <laughs> I always say you plan and you plan and then you know Africa happens. It's just <laughs> everything that could possibly go wrong along the way was happening. And actually I have a quick clip of to give you a sense of what these expeditions are, are like. So now we're off to buy food for a huge group of people, which means we're gonna have hundreds of pounds of rice and beans and vegetables and canned foods and anything our porters can manage to, to take up with us. We need to buy beans, rice. This is a rockless rice. Okay. We need to buy vegetables, garlic, potatoes, onions, that sort of thing. And rope for the tarps and also for the porters to build, yeah, to build the stuff up. This is a major expedition with 10 guides and a film crew. To lug in all these supplies, we'll need about 30 porters. We are about to hike up with over 200 pounds of rice, tea, coffee, dried meats. We've got a ton of food to carry with us. This is a really serious expedition. This is not an easy climb or an easy hike, and all the equipment and all the food we're going to be carrying up is going to take its toll on us. And we're trying to decide where the best part of the river is to cross. A weather front moves in. What started as a shower on top of Roraima turned into a torrent running through camp. All of a sudden, this storm set in, and the wind was just roaring. The waterfall was roaring. The river was coming up. Just the spray from the waterfall alone was tearing up the tarps, and water was just pouring through everywhere. Tarps starting to rip because of the weight of the water up here. This is the reason I will never get a 9 to 5. There's too much fun when this kind of thing happens. I will never get this in an office. and the strain is starting to take its toll. My ankle is killing me. Oh. It's official, we are completely out of food. He said that there's nothing at all to cook for tonight or for tomorrow morning. So if the helicopter doesn't manage to get in here uh, tomorrow, we're gonna have to start walking back and it's gonna be a few days of walking with absolutely nothing to eat. It's, I mean, these guys may not even wanna tag along There is no food in this. <laughs> it's just empty. So how many of you want to go with me on an expedition now? <laughs> that happens a lot. <laughs> Running out of food, not finding enough water. But that was just to give you a little bit of an idea of what it's like out there and, and the challenges of getting to some of these places. This one is definitely one of my favorites. That's me. I know. <laughs> And I'm, I'm hanging on to this little tiny frail rope, <laughs> uh, 14,000 feet up, trying to uh, rappel down into this sinkhole that uh, apparently several explorers had tried but had failed, and uh, partly because they had run out of food getting there because it was just impenetrable forest even getting to that point, and then, well, the logistics and all that. 
and we finally had made it. And we get here, and I'm hanging by this rope. Now again, I'd never been climbing before. It's like geographic, just thought it would be fun. <laughs> no, they actually paid for uh, climbing lessons, which I took in Maryland in an indoor place <laughs> for two days <laughs> with like 40 foot walls and a padded <laughs> floor. And then I get here and I'm like, really? <laughs> Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I knew how to tie a knot. <laughs> uh, but I want to show you a quick clip of just this amazing journey into this sinkhole. Wow. That's a pretty nice sleep down there, yeah. And besides, Wayasapu has an enormous sinkhole hundreds of feet deep that's virtually unknown. And Jesus and I were going down there. I've never climbed before. It is steep. Don't you just remember? I don't want to look down. You gotta get, you gotta get the tension on this. Yeah. All right, Jesus. I'm really coming down. <laughs> remember to keep your legs surely with the part. anything goes wrong, if the anchors come out, the rope frays, we'd have no recourse. First mistake, I looked down. <laughs> I looked down again. <laughs> Above the clouds, the ropes had been set and we could move into position. It's beautiful, bro. Look, all those creeks. No wonder you guys have spiders and snakes and whatnot in this place. Wow, talk about a room with a view. <laughs> oh, yeah. You go hook your um, daisy chain on. This one, this one, and this one are all like kind of good. Not this one. We had oh, finally arrived at the wall camp, but it's a ledge three feet wide with a precipitous drop below us. We'd sleep in hanging tents attached to the rock face with a single steel pin. Good night. Good night. God. That little clip is going to hold <laughs> both of us up. We should have had less dinner. All right. Here we were in this place that had virtually not been explored and it was just one of the most beautiful things I had ever seen when I woke up that morning. Now I have to tell you that falling asleep in that hanging tent <laughs> was a totally different story and I was, you know, I kept looking up at this pin thinking, oh, is it going to hold us? Finally, I fell asleep and my, my colleague Jesus thought it would be really funny to shake it. <laughs> yeah, we'll miss him. <laughs> but. This place really holds true, like, why I do what I do. As a result of this, uh, this journey, uh, several new frog species were named. Uh, we were able to uh, uncover different areas that uh, we learned later had never been explored. And as a consequence, uh, National Geographic explorers have, have gone back and again discovered more species. And this is, yet again, another favorite. It's really, people ask me, what's your favorite expedition? And I give them an hour talk. <laughs> but uh, Western lowland gorillas. And this animal should look familiar because, of course, it's a species of gorillas that you generally see in zoos. Uh, but in the wild, they're one of the least known apes. Uh, and they're, of course, very endangered. And there's a lot of poaching going on, especially in the Congo, uh, where they're found. We've been following this one group uh, of, of gorillas when suddenly the teenager 
being a teenager, just started annoying dad. I mean, annoying dad to no end. And the father, you could see he was, he kept like, you know, pushing him off, pushing him off, like, okay, you're really cut. And finally the dad lost it. I mean, completely <laughs> lost it. <laughs> and uh, here comes the next scene, right? The mom <laughs> comes in and just starts yelling at the dad and telling him off and grabs the, does this sound familiar? <laughs> and grabs the youngster and walks off with him and the males left, you know, the silverbacks left there like, yeah, 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 whatever, <laughs> you know, just I'll change the channel now, you know. <laughs> and then uh, days passed and she didn't come back. And that does not happen with these gorillas. They always sleep together. They don't stray far from the silverback. Didn't come back. And uh, it was actually so pathetic, uh, him crying. I know. It was like they were going through guerrilla divorce. And I just, I just thought, oh gosh, if she could just see him, she'd know. He's so sorry. Uh, and then there was that scientific fear that, wow, this could really just end a, 14, a project that took 14 years to launch, which is a very, very scary thing. The next day we got a call and uh, they had busted poachers in the surrounding area. And I went with my, my heart literally in my stomach uh, to see if uh, these were in fact the animals we had lost. And when I get there, I see this basically what looks like a barbecue pyre with uh, gorilla parts. And you could smell burning flesh as if it was yours or mine. And it was just one of the most horrible moments I had ever experienced out in the field. Uh, and it turns out it was a, a female and a youngster, and I just thought, oh no, this is, I mean, on top of it just being awful, period, uh, these were the animals that I'd been following for, you know, for weeks, and people I'd been following for years, and um, we talked to those locals and found out that, of course, these hands are being used as ashtrays, and who's buying them but foreigners, and their meat is being sold for less than five dollars a pound. Uh, and I'll tell you now that it wasn't them. <laughs> so that's the, the happy ending is that the group was reunited. The youngster went to college. <laughs> they lived happily ever after. No, but they really did. I mean, they got back together. They worked it out. He bought her diamonds. I don't know. But they worked it out. This little thing is what? Anybody? Not a, yeah, a mouse lemur. And this one in particular is one that I discovered with my colleague, Dr. Ed Lewis, in the field. And this was a huge thing f for me at, at many levels. Every scientist dreams of discovering a new species. I never thought it would happen. You know, I was, I was that cheerleader. <laughs> I never thought I'd discover a new species. Well, it happened. And I, I want to show you a quick clip of, uh, of a very special moment when we captured it. I am flying over to the scene, if I can get there. Angelo! <laughs> this is it, possibly our tiniest relative. A new species of primate never seen before outside of Madagascar. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my god. So cute. We've got the lemur in the bag. This little guy will become an ambassador. Photos and film will be shown around the world and hopefully help get Madagascar's forests protected.
After a week of searching, it all comes down to one busy morning. A photo shoot with a new star. And of course, before we release it, a whole lot of science. Now, what that clip doesn't show you is that it was, it was obviously late at night when we captured it. So I had to uh, take it back to my tent overnight and we were going to do all this, uh, the scientific measurements and the, the taking of the little blood for genetic samples, all of that, we were going to do that in the morning. So I took it back to my tent in, this, in that little bag and uh, I kept staring at it and looking at it. And then he really wanted to come out. So I took him out. And then I couldn't catch him. <laughs> and he was running around my tent. And I thought, oh my god, this is like the only one we have. <laughs> and we'd been there weeks. And we finally found it. And um, anyhow, all night I looked for this thing in my tent. I thought, how do I tell the producers that I've lost this mouse lemur? Um, and the next morning, as I was going to put on my shoe, I decided to look in it. <laughs> and there it was. So that was lucky. <laughs> uh, and. <laughs> And I'm not squeezing it too hard, <laughs> but it's had a little bit of drugs at this point. <laughs> but the amazing thing about this tiny little creature that fits in your pocket, you know, weighs less than two ounces, is that it became a huge ambassador for all things wild in Madagascar. And I think that was the most exciting thing for me. I mean, the scientific significance and discovery that was pretty amazing. But what, what this little guy did for all things wild in Madagascar, I could have never anticipated. Ah, then I met Tarzan. <laughs> <laughs> Except not so much. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I did spend a lot of time out in, you know, in the wilderness and, and that sort of thing. And um, like my mom had dreamt for me, I too wanted uh, to start a family. And I met this wonderful person that I married. And soon, we had our first little daughter named Emma. This is where I'm going to tell you a little bit about my family life. <laughs> because explorers have families too. <laughs> and it's important for me to always share that message, especially when I, when I talk to, to uh, young women who think they have to make a choice between the two. I think it's very important that they know that, that balance in life is very important and very achievable. And uh, I definitely got balance at this point with this little one. Um, but I was missing the wilds. <laughs> so I decided uh, when Emma was nine months old to take her to Madagascar and share these amazing animals and places with her. And you see her interested in that snake? Well, I mean, she was mesmerized by lemurs, but I really think there's a little budding herpetologist in her, because she, she loved everything like frog, chameleon, snakes, which I'm OK with. That's OK. <laughs> um, but the, the funniest part is I picked up a snake because it was on the road, and it was about to become roadkill, as so many of the snakes there do. Um, and she was crying and fussy, so I picked her up too. <laughs> now I've got this, this toddler, or this infant, and, and this, this snake. And well, she was teething, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, I see the locals, who are terrified of snakes, by the way, jumping up and down, waving their arms. And I'm like, it's OK. It's a snake. It's fine. And I look down, and she's using it as a teething ring. <laughs> and so that was. Uh, Anyway, just another cool use for snakes, I guess. <laughs> but uh, didn't hurt the snake, didn't seem to even be bothered or care, and she was happy, so I let her. <laughs> you know, it was fine. <laughs> then soon I had Ava. <laughs> and suddenly I had these, these two little girls, and I really, there came a point where I thought, am I being selfish? Going, you know, because I was still leading expeditions and, and leaving my, uh, my little girl behind. And now I had a second one. You know, was I being selfish? And it was my own mom who, you know, didn't want me in the beginning to go on these expeditions. In fact, you know, she'd cry every time I had to walk out the door, who said to me, you can't stop doing who you are, basically. You know, you're an explorer, and you're not going to be doing your, your kids any favors 
by not being who you are. And I took that as permission. <laughs> but I, I listened to those words very carefully and I realized that she was absolutely right. I would be out miserable. Uh, I, I can't live without the wilds. I can't live without going out there and exploring. And, you know, I said I, I wasn't uh, allowed to be a Girl Scout when I was little. So sad. <laughs> but I just want you to know that I recently, I spoke to a huge group of Girl Scouts and they made me an honorary member. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure I'm going to be allowed back, but it was fun. <laughs> it was really, really fun. Um, <laughs> but this is really my message. And that's, uh, you know, save the lemurs, but that could blank that out for any animal, any wild place. You know, do your part, be informed, come to these talks and be inspired. Uh, and uh, I thank you for coming very much. Thank you.